Welcome to the Weightlifting Scoop. We've got Travis Cooper and the Glenn Pendley here with us today. Very formal introduction. Thank you, James. <laughs> Thank you, James. No problem. Anytime. <laughs> Uh, the 78th episode, you know, James was supposed to be the host on the 77th episode, and he wasn't able to make it. He got supplanted by uh, Caleb Whitby, I think. Yep, Caleb yeah. Whitby came in, and um, James, you are taking care of your taxes. The government is either taking your money or giving you some back. I don't know, but... Well, I hope they give me some. <laughs> I doubt it, but... <laughs> yeah, they, cer- they certainly didn't give me any. Um I got boned. The IRS kicked me in the nuts and took all my money. So they're the bullies on the playground, I guess. Mm. Yeah. Well, they they might be the uh, the child abductors on the playground. <laughs> the that's child how I abductors. like to look at it. <laughs> well, that's probably a good way to look at it, yeah. They're giving you free candy or taking you away. Something like that. Well, they, they took candy away, but, I mean, they didn't take me anywhere. I'm still here. Um Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know how, you know, don't know how long, you know, they could come at any minute, you know. Well, I paid them, so it is what it is, and it's all over now. So, so you bought some time. Good luck to everyone out there paying their taxes over the next month. I feel for you. Trust me, I got hit hard. Um, so, Glenn, you been rowing? Yeah, I have been. It's kind of taken uh, the place of uh, lifting in my post-stroke life, you know, I needed something to do, and lifting heavy wasn't really in the cards, you know, immediately post uh, that traumatic event, and so, you know, I've been doing a lot of rowing, and, you know, I, uh, it's definitely not ex- as exciting as lifting, mm-hmm. and I wouldn't say that I enjoy it just as much or anything, but it's something to do, you know, it's something to do to keep from being bored, to keep from being inactive and to attempt to be healthier. You know, I've lost a fair amount of weight. Um, I think when I went to the hospital, I was close to 300 pounds and I was 290 or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I came out of the hospital weighing about 250 or weighing probably about 245 or 240. But within, you know, a week of being back home, I was basically 250 again. And since then I've stayed around 250, 255. Um, pretty steady. And, uh, you know, part of the reason that I've kept that weight is from rowing, you know, and, uh, it's started to get competitive a little bit. I've started to get a little bit of at least competition with myself. I'm certainly in no danger of competing with anybody else, you know, but just competing with myself is trying, you know, I'm trying to make it fun. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, uh, getting my, times for the 2k down pretty steadily um it's it's upsetting that i'm not like you know popping off six minute 2ks or something because obviously i would feel a lot better about myself if i was super competitive in that which i'm not i think my best time for a 2k right now is about 8 30 um which is you know it's not bad for someone who's never rode for someone who's not any kind of an endurance athlete, you know, it's not terrible. There are probably people that could do worse or would do worse. Um, so I feel fortunate that I can still do that. And I certainly am looking forward to times when my, you know, time comes down. I mean, I feel like in the past week or two or three, you know, even though my times have not dropped in the last two weeks, um, they were dropping pretty steady two weeks ago or three weeks ago. And I feel like I've been been able to maintain about the same pace with a little less effort, a lot less effort, actually, you know, popping off, you know, two or uh, one minute and 30 second two K's has gotten really easy. Whereas even though my time is 30 second minute, 30 seconds. Oh yeah. Perfect. Nine minutes and 30 seconds. Oh, uh, okay. I was better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's what I was, that would be, that would be, uh, well beyond my capabilities. Um, <laughs> anyone's for that. Yeah. Matter. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, it's not requiring the same effort as it once did. And, and, uh, so I'm happy with that. Definitely happy with that. Yeah. I mean, it's good to do something, stay in shape, get the heart moving a little bit. And, uh, 
And uh, we were going to make a video called Pinlay Rose. Well. And put put you doing a 500. And that was like, I, I, I overheard this. And if there's a such thing as your peripheral hearing, um, off in the distance. Well, I heard that you uh, somebody was thinking about putting that up there just because obviously there's that oh, rowing yeah. exercise that is pinlay rows. So it's yeah, kind of a I good think plan uh, that's something that Josh may have talked about or something like that. You know, the the thing is, I'm not quite sure. I'm not sure that I want to do an all out 500 meter row. You know, <laughs> um, I'm not sure that I want to do an all out 2K row um, anytime immediately. I mean, I feel like I have some more training to get in before I try a 2K again. The last one I did was, you know, I pushed really hard. And so when you, when you push really, that's the thing about rowing. If you push really hard on rowing, I mean, obviously if you're at my level, it's an eight or nine minute exertion and you're not really in a, in a huge hurry to do it again, at least not immediately. Mm-hmm. You know, you kind of have to back off and train for a while and help you hopefully feel like you've made some solid improvements before you, you know, get ready to die and go through that pain and agony again. Well, I'd imagine to a certain extent it's like that for most sports. Um, you know, like just like weightlifting, you come back from a competition, you want to kind of go back, take a step back. and. Uh, you know, goddamn, Travis, I just found my sunglasses. I thought I lost these things. Sorry to interrupt you. <laughs> this thought, is not due to weight. This is not part were, of weightlifting. You're going to be like, you're fucking wrong. <laughs> no, I know. No. I was just like, wow. <laughs> no, I, what sparked I that did. emotional response to? I remember that I put these glasses in here um, Monday or Tuesday, one of those days. And last night or this morning, I realized as I was coming to work, damn, I forgot my glasses. And of course, you know, the sun was in my eyes and things like that. And then, you know, I didn't know where my glasses were and well, I just found them. Yeah. So, well, you did just well, put them back yeah. right in the same spot that you <laughs> I lost did. them. So. I figure that, uh, I figure that, you know, that's a good spot because I was able to find them. Oh, okay. <laughs> <You know? laughs> if I lost them and then came back to them and found them, that has to be a decent spot. This table, man, Travis well, left his phone here one time and. Couldn't find it. And then now you're leaving your glasses? <laughs> well, we do We do spend a fair amount of time here at the podcast well, I've left, table, and yeah. we, we always use the same mics. I've at, left at my phone three. here um, at least one time, maybe two. But luckily, it survived. It was there right where I put it in the, the next day. So that's a good thing. I don't think there are too many people roaming the halls here at Muscle Driver. Things are pretty safe. I don't know that I'd probably leave my computer over here for the weekend or something like that. It's more just, it'd make me nervous, you know. Uh, I don't think that anybody would really steal it or anything like that. But, you know, you always want to keep your stuff close. Especially over the weekend. There wouldn't be anybody here. Well, true, true. (laughs) (laughs) I'd be like, I'd be like, yeah, that's a perfect time to leave it. (laughs) Uh, You and your logic. Yeah, ain't nobody Um, got time for that. (laughs) Well, not to put you on the spot, Glenn, but about a month ago when you came on the podcast, you said you were going to quit dipping. Is there an update on that? There is an update on that. I have, you know, probably there's not the update that everyone wants to hear that, oh, I've totally quit. But I will tell you what, even though I have not totally quit yet, Mm -hmm. I have cut back and it's been hard, you know, I, 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 I think maybe I underestimated how hard it would be a little bit. Um, and probably if I wouldn't have underestimated it, if I would have, uh, if I would have realized how hard it would be to quit, I may have not even tried to quit. So it's a good thing that I actually underestimated it and it spurred me to try. And I will say this, um, so far I have gone from dipping basically a can of dip every two days, um, to a can of dip uh, every about eight days. Mm-hmm. Well, that's that's a substantial decrease. Yeah, that's a that's a good decrease, and so I feel like I'm on the right track. And I also, you know, have gone close to a day several times without dipping. And I tell you, the the main thing that I've used to, you know, I haven't qu- I haven't yet chewed the gum. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I know there's a there's a nicotine gum out there for that's available for use, and uh, I I I chewed that like. The first, when I first started to try to quit, I bought some of that and I chewed a little bit. 
but I just feel like, you know, that's just adding more nicotine. And, and so I don't know, I don't know how useful that would be. But, uh, the main thing that I've done is I've just cut down on both the times that I dip, you know, um, I'm dipping very rarely now, you know, I used to dip, have a dip in my mouth almost all day long. Yeah. You know, pretty much all day long and a big dip at that, you know, I was getting lots of nicotine and now I dip very rarely. If I, you know, I try to keep it to, you know, once a day, sometimes twice a day, but sometimes once a day, mm-hmm. um, and go a long periods of time when I don't have any dip in my mouth as much as I can. And the dips that I'm taking are extremely small. And that's been the main reason that I'm not dipping there as much. So my, a can of dip is lasting me well over a week. And that's a huge decrease from, you know, the, what I used to do. Um, I can remember getting a dip or, or I can remember dipping in the morning and needing another can the next day. And, uh, you know, I started a can some morning and I wasn't able to make it last even till the end of the day. And of course that's crazy. You know, that's just crazy. Well, that, that becomes a pretty expensive habit. That is uh that's, you have to budget that in to your well, mon- monthly salary. With, yeah. Uh, but I, mean, right? <laughs> I mean, I look at it this way. Yeah. I'm saving money, which is awesome. Sorry for your foot there, Travis. I just <laughs> stepped just on stepped Travis's on my foot. foot. <laughs> but, uh, it's, I'm definitely saving money and that's a good thing. Anytime you can, you can cut out useless expenses. That's wonderful. But dip is not that expensive. It's definitely not like smoking. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, maybe if it was more expensive, I'd have more impetus to quit. But a can of dip here in South Carolina costs about $2. I, ch- I chew the uh, cheap brand, <laughs> Grizzly. Um, I think you can get Copenhagen or something like that that costs like $4. But I chew whatever's cheapest. Yeah. And so a, a can costs like $2, and I'm making a can last you know, upwards of eight days. And so it really is not a huge expense if I chew a, you know, a couple mm-hmm. of cans a month or something, uh, you know, but it's, but it's saving me a little bit of money and that always helps. That's always good. I mean, nobody has money to burn, but you know, you'll have to wait until our next dipping update, um, for the, <laughs> for the news that I've quit totally. I know that's going to be hard. That's a, that's a, you know, another step, <clears throat> but I figure every day that I can, not have dip in my mouth for, you know, three or four hours or, you know, eat breakfast and not put a dip in, um, come back from lunch, go to lunch and not put a dip in, come back from lunch, not put a dip in immediately, can wait a few hours. And then, as I said, just dip an incredibly small amount. I mean, I'm like pinching just smallest amount of dip I possibly can out of the can um, to make it last, you know, and to get like the least amount of nicotine that I can. And so, you know, for, I, I heard a lot of people the last time I talked about this, I had a lot of well wishes from, uh, the fans, I guess you'd say, or just fellow lifters. Um, I think that's a better term than fans, you know, but everybody seemed to be, uh, uh, you know, very ready to congratulate me on my efforts and on, you know, making the, the attempt to stop. And I'll have to say, you know, like I said, it's been, it's been hard. Um, but I'm definitely on the right track and I regret to say that I haven't totally stopped yet. Well, actually we, uh, you had asked us to hold you accountable and asked you on the podcast when you said it at first. So I waited a couple of weeks and then asked you again. And I actually, we haven't asked too much. Um, but I, I do think it's definitely better to have a very slow decrease in the amount that you're doing than quit and then two weeks later uh, yeah. get right back to well, the Well, because same I've started – I've, I've done that before where yeah. I just ba- basically quit almost cold turkey. And, you know, after a week or two, I was just go- going absolutely freaking crazy and wanting to dip so bad that I just broke down and bought a new can and, you know, put, to put like a third of the can in my mouth. And so, you know, I've tried that before. <laughs> And that wasn't, that didn't work. About the only time that I successfully, I say successfully, even though I did eventually start again, but successfully stopped dipping. I stopped for like eight weeks and I did it with a gum 
Um, I thought I, I thought you were going to say <laughs> gun. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, did it with I a gun. didn't use a gun. No, I didn't use any firearms. But I did it with the uh, nicotine gum, and I also did it by. Um, and this is, uh, you know, a little bit gross, but, you know, I did it, so I should admit to it. I did it by, um, using those pouches. And mm-hmm. I basically redipped the pouches. You know, you can mm-hmm. take those out and they don't really fall apart. You know, they're incredibly tough. Right. So you can take a pouch out and then put it back in your mouth later in the day or whatever. And I, you know, got to where I would take a pouch out and then put it back in my mouth three hours later. And at that point, once you've had it in your mouth for quite a while like that, you're not getting almost any nicotine out of it. Yeah. But And it comes basically like a safety net, like a pacifier or something in your mouth that makes you feel better, you know, because you have it in, because you're satisfying that, uh, that I guess, craving just for the action of sucking on something or whatever. You know what I mean? Travis got one time. Well, Travis doesn't dip. Um, but I got a uh, coffee pouches. Oh yeah, I've actually I've heard of those. I think I've, I think I put one in my mouth one time. In fact, I might have got one of yours. Yeah, yeah. It yeah wasn't it, that they weren't that great, but uh, yeah, it's it, interesting. The idea of it is, is it is cool. It's called Grinds Coffee Pouches. The uh, idea of yeah. it is awesome. Uh, just the flavor that we got definitely wasn't good, but. Uh, I think you know that that could be a good way to wean yourself off of. Well, that might be. I mean, you know what I mean. You know, if I had some of those to try, I probably would try it. The only downfall of that is that obviously, with me having had the stroke and everything else, um, the doctors really don't want me drinking a bunch of coffee. Mm, You know, and and because that raises your blood pressure, and I have to say, my blood pressure is pretty under control right now. I mean, the last time I was at uh, the pharmacy, the last time I was at the hospital, or at the doctor's office, excuse me, the doctor's office, I was about 141 or something over, you know, 90, I guess, or something like that. Um, You know, that's a little high. The doctor says, you know, given my history of high blood pressure, that's reasonable, very reasonable for somebody my weight. But it's definitely a little higher than I think would be ideal. But the last time I was at the pharmacy, we were just there picking up a prescription, probably a pres- prescription for blood pressure medication. Mm-hmm. You know, I I did the whole thing where you put your arm in a little machine and mm-hmm. it measured your blood pressure, and I think it was 135 um, was the top number. Um, so that's getting more reasonable. I mean, it's definitely uh, coming down gradually. Um, I... I think back when I was in rehab, there were definitely a lot of days that I was over 150 uh, for the top number. So that's high. That's definitely high, you know. So it's been coming down gradually over time. I think some of that has been probably not as much as I would like to think has been due to diet. Although I, I have tried to hold a, to a better diet even than I used to have, and I, I think I always have thought that I had a pretty good diet. I mean, I don't eat much junk food or really almost any junk food at all. Uh, but what the doctor said basically is with my history and having had the stroke and everything, I need to cut down on, you know, the animal protein and red meat mm-hmm. and things like that. Of course, you know, I have a feeling that doctors always say that and it's probably, you know, you should probably use some common sense when heating those, uh, those things. But definitely, I think I could stand to cut down on some things. And and uh, so I don't think my diet has been a major part of it. But I think a part of it's been the rowing. You know, I think uh, doing intense 2K rows, which keeps your heart rate, obviously, very elevated mm-hmm. for, you know, around 8 to 10 minutes. Um, and some after some afternoons or evenings, I will do a 2K row and then rest... 10 minutes or 20 minutes or even 30 minutes or something and then do another one and sometimes even do like 500 meter intervals where I'll do like four or five 500 intervals so that's you know a good amount of rowing yeah. um, on top of one or two two k's so that's that's a lot of rowing and a lot of uh you know I I try to keep a some account of my heart rate while I do it and I'm definitely in the training zone. You know, I'm definitely mm-hmm. have it really elevated. And that's something that I have not had a lot of experience doing. I mean, I ran cross country when I was way back in high school, 
but I'm sure all those training adaptations are long gone by now. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, I had an endurance background, I guess, but, uh, I think that the rowing and keeping up with the rowing and doing it regularly has definitely probably helped my blood pressure and probably helped me, um, become healthier. Yeah. Well, losing fat too. And just having that pressure, uh, just on your blood yeah. vessels and heart and stuff, uh, decreases the blood pressure a lot. Also, muscle mass. You probably built uh, build up a little bit more muscle mass after laying in the hospital for a while. Kind of yeah, as a buffer. I would. I would. You know, I had to have. You know, because I was laid there for a good amount of time in a coma, not doing anything. Yeah. You know, I had no activity whatsoever, um, and then you know I was under sedation for quite a while, and basically with no chance to even get out of bed or even sit up in bed, and so. You know, I was so out of shape when I came out of the coma that sitting in a wheelchair was extremely hard. You know, I mean, sitting up and getting in, getting into a wheelchair took, you know, basically everything I had. Mm. Of course, that really, that really, um, didn't, that didn't last that long. Of course, just normal activity, you're going to build back strength and muscle mass and everything else. And I did go through rehab. So I did have some exercise and, you know, part of the rehab was just, you know, I was in a, you know, in a hospital basically. And so, you know, just walking the halls, you know, walking around the hospital, of course, it was kind of a pain in the ass because they don't want you to get out of your wheelchair when you're in rehab. Yeah. You know, they're very adamant that if you step out of your room, you have to be in a wheelchair. Um, so that kind of, you know, put some brakes on my activity, definitely. But, uh, but, you know, they did. Pretty hard rehab and pretty, um, pretty st- stimulating, uh, stimulating from a muscular standpoint, I think. Um, and so that definitely got me back in the right direction. But I think I've said this before, maybe even when we talked about, you know, my having a stroke initially, uh, several weeks ago. But when I got out of rehab and tried to step out into the real world for the first time, um, I went to the mall. I, I went with my girlfriend to the mall and getting standing and walking a very short amount. And then I tried to ride the escalators, mm-hmm. you know, to go up to the second floor and then down again. I think we were in pennies or something. And the, the amount of muscular coordination that it takes to step onto the escalator and have your balance to where you can put one foot in front of the other one and then balance on it immediately so that you don't fall on the escalator was extremely hard. I mean, that was like a major thing for me to do. Yeah. Something that you take for granted. Like once you can do it, it's like, uh, you know, no. Yeah. Once you've done it once, (laughs) I mean, you'd have, I, people I'm sure thought that here's this fairly decent sized guy who looks okay, but yet he's, making a spectacle of trying to get on and off of this escalator, (laughs) you know, and I'm sure they thought I was crazy or something or deranged, but it was a difficult thing to do. It was a difficult thing to accomplish. And of course, right now I would have no trouble just because of, you know, through normal activity. But then, then again, you know, I've definitely built some muscle back. I mean, I, I can tell, I can, you know, take my shirt off and tell that I'm not quite as, you know, you know, unmuscular and flabby and whatever as I was when I just got out of rehab, you know, so I've, I've definitely improved in that some, you know, some amount. And I recently started squatting. Yeah. Yeah. I was about about to mention that. Him and Don are, they're going to have another workout today. They were talking about it when we came in for the podcast. So yeah, well, I think Don's hopefully going to keep me honest and Don McCauley and, uh, Sean Rigsby, has uh the first two times I did it was my spotter, yeah. You know, and uh, you know, it's it's I feel, I feel stupid even saying that because you know you need a spotter for fifty two kilos. Well, you know? it was a balance thing, just like the yeah. escalator. You yeah, had to get used to it again. It's, I have to have squatted. To, you before. know, when I when I the first time that I squatted, I squatted forty kilos for a set of five, and the second time I squatted fifty two kilos for a set of five, and uh, you know, the first. You know, I did five reps and the first two or three, I was in real danger of losing it. You know, of, of not, not because it was too hard, although it was hard. I hate to say that, but it was, you know, hard, but I was in real danger of falling. You know, yeah. if you get too far forward or too far back or side to side, you know, um, you could fall. 
And so it was definitely good to have him back there as a spotter. But as long as Don keeps uh, me honest on squatting, you know, three times a week is kind of both of our plan. I think, you know, he recently had, um, he's of course had some uh, surgeries on his heart and he's had some heart problems. And so he's pretty healthy right now because he's got on several different kinds of heart medication, but he needs to exercise. And so we're trying to motivate each other to exercise. And, uh, I think it's helpful. It's helpful to both of us. And, you know, I can't, I, I definitely think that, uh, some of the guys, you know, even though they probably think we're ridiculous for being old and, you know, squatting like 50 kilos or 60 kilos and making a production out of it. But, you know, I, I think they, like the fact that we're actually exercising. I mean, <clears throat> if I was a lifter and if I was Travis or James and I was out there busting my ass trying to do pulls and push presses and this and that, and I was being coached by somebody who didn't do anything, you know, I, I couldn't say it would be a bad thing, but I, I can say that it would get old. You know, I think it would be nice as a lifter to see your coach doing at least something. You know, at least something to know that they're doing physical activity and training hard and trying hard, um, the same as the lifters are. So my motivation is basically to be healthy and as healthy as I can be and to do something that, that jives with the overall goals of muscle driver. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want to be that guy that doesn't train at all. You know, I, I, you know, am thoroughly immersed in the whole uh, training program here and situation here at muscle driver. And, you know, I think it's a great place and, you know, uh, a great concept and, you know, it's, it's my life. And I think, you know, being a part of that, you can't be a part of that without training at all. And even though I'm only squatting 50 kilos now or 52 kilos now, mm -hmm. you know, at least I'm squatting and I'm trying and I feel good about that. Well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was fun to see you guys squat. Um, uh... We do have a few questions that we need to get to. I know James got a couple, um, so we do have some technique talk coming up. Um, so, James, do you have a couple questions? Do you want to go ahead? Yeah, so I, uh, I got an email from a guy, and uh, he said uh, he was getting bruises on his uh, collarbone and uh, from when he cleaned when the weight got heavy. And he said he asked Bob Ticano, about it, and Bob Ducano said, "You just need to get bigger delts." Um, and he said, "Is that it? Is like, is that all there is to it?" And um, and really, I mean, in my opinion, yeah, that's that's about it. Some, or if your clavicle just sticks out further than your delts, just the way you're built. Some people have a lot of bruises and holes in their skin up there at their clavicle from the cleans, like Donnie. Mm -hmm. um, me, I had, I actually have like fairly thick calluses on my collarbone as gross as that sounds um but just part of weightlifting and it might get better it might not uh Ke kevin always had like kind of like deep cuts yeah, he had like holes in his skin um, yeah so i've seen it in a few people i've never had a problem with it i don't think most people on the team have had a problem with it uh john never did um so i'm trying to think but i I never had a problem when I lifted with, with it. Um, and I'll, I'll say this, you know, what I think one of the things that, you know, that is, is not just related to your body type that leads to that problem is just catching the clean with your elbows too far down mm -hmm. because that is going to put the bar closer to your collarbone or on top of your collarbone or allow it to interfere with, you know, your skin, um, a lot more if your elbows are really up as far as you can put them so that, uh, you know, they're rotated forward. If your elbows are rotated forward, you're going to have less trouble with that. And when you go to jerk, if your elbows are rotated forward, um, before you do the jerk, of course, you don't want to get too carried away with that. You can do that too much, but if you start putting your elbows straight down, pointing to the ground before the jerk, um, that makes it difficult. Yeah, well, and then, again, when you do that, when you rotate your elbows forward, you're almost bringing your shoulder uh, complex forward to be supported, to support the barbell. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you want to create a shelf for the bar to sit on, yeah. so kind of like getting your elbows around enough so that that shelf is, is there uh, definitely 
something that you want to do. Yeah. And then it's, it's hard to say, like each person's going to be different. Like all three of us, uh, never had an issue, but then other people have terrible issues with it. So it's, Mm-hmm. It's just going to be it's come down to proportions of the shoulder and the arm and all that, but um, yeah, not much help on that one. <laughs> uh, I also got another question. Somebody was asking uh, about programming, um, and I don't know if you wanted to mention this, Travis, but I know that uh, you're working on something. Oh, online programming. Um, yeah, a few people on the team do online programming. I know. I know Tom does his own thing. Uh, I do my own thing. Um, I'm working with uh Becca Gurdon and we're going to be coming out with an, an online team and it's going to be coming out in the next month or so we're going to do a uh, a week's free trial so people understand kind of like what the deal is um so something that's going to happen in the future I don't have all the details right this moment but keep that in mind keep a lookout it's going to be exciting <laughs> <laughs> well that that should work out really good with you and Becca cuz both of you guys mm-hmm. you know Number one, you're definitely, and I've said this a million times, uh, well, maybe not a million, but I've said this several times, you know, Travis is one of the more intelligent lifters that I know of, and he has done several seminars with me, and I'm sure many seminars by himself, and he's just an intelligent guy and and uh, uh, has a very good mind for weightlifting, you know, and Rebecca has, of course, an educational background um, in uh, sports science, and I think those two should be a good combination. Yeah, and then, uh, you know, I I brought Becca on because, um, you know, as as a female, she deals with problems that I would never understand, and so, you know, we were trying to cover the, the male and female clients, and, um, and hopefully, eventually, one day, we'll have a team competing at the Nationals, you know, an online team, which I think would be pretty cool, and potentially in the future have camps, you know, two or three times a year where we can kind of come up with a central location and, and get these online clients together to train together and meet each other. And um, So the eventual plan, some pretty cool things, but obviously a lot of these things are lo- very long-term goals. Um, right now we're just trying to come up with the first 12-week cycle um, to get people ready for a meet. Um, and then we're going to come out with that uh, the trial week. Um, so that's kind of the deal with that. So if you're interested in, in, and I'll explain more as it gets closer. Um, and then Glenn had a few questions. Well, I had, there was a question on the Pendlay forum here a few days ago, um, about why it is so important to get your hips into the bar and, or make, or make the bar make contact in the hips instead of finishing early. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess I say it just a little differently, but I think we both mean the same thing. Um, that's very important in weightlifting because the closer the hips are to the bar, the less work on the bar you have to do in order to make it go up. If the bar is six inches out in front of your hips, Mm -hmm. you're going to have to pull a lot harder on that bar in order to make it move and move fast enough to snatch it or clean it. Um, it's just simple physics. You know, it's just simple physics. Um, you know, the other thing that you can kind of mess up by having the bar out in front of your hips is the bar path. You know, if the bar comes off your hips or, you know, it's going to be very close to you and it can, at least it should basically go straight up. Of course, you're going to have a little deviation of the bar path, but you're not going to have a huge rounded bar, bar path. Um, Whereas if the bar is coming back to you a considerable amount as it passes the hips um, or has a considerable amount to go back as it passes the hips, uh, the bar is going to jump forward off the hips um, or, you know, go forward in some instance. um, And it's going to make it just harder to have a straight bar path and harder to make it make a lift complete. Um, The other thing I wanted to say about that is really that starts with the position at the knee. If you get the bar back as you go past the knee and the bar is moving backwards and you attempt to move the bar backwards as it passes the knee and goes up to the hips, then getting it into the hips is going to be much easier and the whole bar path is going to be better and the lift is going to be easier. 
But if your bar is going forward as it passes the knee, you're going to be behind the behind the curve, so to speak, and it, the whole thing is going to be more difficult. Yeah, and I think that's one of the big parts is the difference between bringing the bar to your hips or bringing your hips to the bar. If the bar is going forward at the knee and you're still making contact with the bar, that means you're probably bringing your hips to the bar forward and then banging it out front, whereas if you get the knees back and the bar is moving backwards into you, um, and of course this would be for your standard S pull. Um, yeah. Well, so the second question to clarify was why is it important to have the bar coming in off the floor instead of going straight up or even a little away from you? Um, so the main reason for that is, I mean, just, you know, Newton's laws of physics, you know, if, if, um, if something is, uh, is moving, you know, if something is in motion, it stays in motion until uh, an equal or opposite reaction acts upon it, right? So if the bar starts going away from you, you have to influence a lot to move towards you. But uh, but if the bar is coming in towards you, it's very hard to, to make it change directions and go away from you, which is good. You want it to come into you. Um, so you really want to start influencing that bar right off the floor just to get it moving towards you, and then that's what really makes it easy to get the bar into the hips. Yeah, an exercise that we've been doing, um, and in fact did Monday, that I think has really helped. Um, as Don and I watched the video from Monday this afternoon, and, I mean, we had a pretty good training on Monday. You know, mm -hmm. watching the video, I was astounded at how many good lifts were done. You know, Trevor had some great lifts. He looked like a world champion in the video. You know, he, he looked great. You know, James didn't look bad. You know, I mean. <laughs> oh, I so mean, Trevor, Trevor looked better than me, huh? Well, you know, in that video, Trevor did look ba better than anyone. Dang. You know, he, he <laughs> well, you know, got to be honest, you know, Trevor looking at the bar and how it came off his hips. And, you know, Trevor is very explosive with his hips. And when that bar comes off his hips, it just jumps up. You know, it's, I think it's partially because he has such a good vertical. I yeah. Mean, when he pop, when he pops his hips into the bar, the bar just like levitates. You know, it just jumps upward. Mm -hmm. And so watching him do that in the video, I was kind of astounded. I was like, wow. You know, he's maybe a better lift than I thought than I thought he was. You know, the video yeah. made that you know perfect perfectly clear. Um, of course, he doesn't do it that way every time. Of course, that's one thing that uh, becoming a good lifter entails is moving from doing something once in a while just perfect to doing it over and over and over and over again until you basically can't do it wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, and he's Trevor's at the point where he can he can do uh, sometimes he can do the lifts just so well that you think, wow, you know, there's yeah. nothing, no, nothing else to work on. I mean, you've got it down. Yeah. You so know? on Monday, the exercise that uh, we did, what I think you're talking about is we did two high pulls, two high pulls and then a snatch and then a snatch. And he just looked great and doing that. He did 140, if I remember. Mm -hmm. Yes, he did. And his high pulls were high. Were very high. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's, it, it's impressive to see so him. So you do see a high what pull. I mean when he can just pop the bar and it just jumps up. Yeah. And it, it just floats up there. It just kind of yeah. hangs out. It's not a, it's not a very fast upward motion, but it's a very smooth and it goes up very high. Yeah. 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 He's very good at that, you know, and, and he did a very good job of it. And, uh, he definitely looked as I watched the video, you know, I hate to, I hate to, you know, downgrade anyone else here, you know, present company included, but I have to say that watching the video, Trevor definitely stood out as, yeah. as just being mm -hmm. at, well, that, at that particular exercise. He was, he was the one that really looked the best. As competitive as we all are, you still got to give credit where it's due. Yeah. 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 I mean, 140 in that exercise is certainly, I mean, that's a huge weight. And James is 137, which is huge too. Yeah. I didn't look and, as good uh, as his, but you know. <laughs> I was still proud of it. <laughs> I mean, yeah, with with two high pulls before you do a snatch, those are tiring. I mean, Trevor definitely has some pretty crazy high pulls, so it's that transition phase. It, when it's on, he can snatch like crazy. Um, but, yeah, so that's a good exercise to really focus on making sure the bar's coming in is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that make was sure a, you kind of got That was an exercise that uh, definitely, you know, Trevor looked great. Um, Rigsby didn't have a, as great a day, you know, but, uh, you know, uh, 
Rebecca looked pretty good doing it. You know, a lot of the people really looked good. And I was, I was kind of su pleasantly surprised as I watched it, you know, after having watched the training session. And I missed, um, part of this training session about a half an hour. I think I, um, actually left a little bit early. So I missed the end of the training session. Um, but, you know, being able to watch it on video like that two days later, you know, I was definitely, um, definitely impressed with what you guys are doing. Well, so the the reason why that's a good exercise is because it kind of primes your body to keep the bar close. You're doing the high pulls, um, and then you go right into that snatch. So it just kind of primes you to keep that bar close, make sure you're popping the hips, getting that jump. Um, and yeah. everybody did pretty well with that. And, yeah, after and these high pulls, too, they're... They're what Don calls the competition pull, or some mm -hmm. people call it the panda pull, yeah. where you move the feet when you after you finish with the hips, and you kind of almost start pulling yourself under. Yeah, yeah. So it's not a it's not a, it's like a, a Chinese style pull. Yeah, it's yeah. not a straight legged high pull. You're you're, yeah. you're bending your knees back under, so you're transitioning under at the right time. So after watching how good everybody looked doing those, I mean, I am in favor of doing those probably more often than we have in the past. I mean, everybody looked really good, and I think it's a great exercise. I, I would I would be happy to see us do those, you know, for the next couple of weeks still, you know. Yeah. I don't know how excited everyone is about that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it may not be an exciting exercise, but you guys look good doing it. Give us a chance to be Trevor. Yeah, yeah, you've got to get that 141. Yeah, I know. Hopefully he doesn't go for 142, though, because he'll make it. Uh, <laughs> well, Trevor's got a weird uh, ability um, to make lifts that you don't think he can make. Well, I think his testosterone is raising. You know why? Why? He, uh, I actually let him borrow these books. His, uh, he's started reading Game of Thrones. Oh. So, I mean, if you read those books, of course, well, he was reading Cl Clavel's Christ. book, I think, already. Um, the, the Asian saga, you know. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, Taipan, I think he was reading. Yeah, I think, yeah, you guys so are that, talking that about that. That raises your testosterone. Of course, of you course. Know, James Clavel is an awesome author, and the whole, uh, the whole Asian saga is some of the greatest books ever written in my money, you know, for my money, evidently. I mean, you know, they're just great, and, uh, that should have, giving him, him a testosterone boost well man i tell you what I, I watched the movie the wolf of wall street last night yeah and um i'm not gonna go into too much detail but talk about some testosterone raising Jeez, man hottest chick i've ever seen plenty of nude scenes it's good stuff but uh well i'll have to uh <laughs> <laughs> i have to put that on the list <laughs> it uh it, it's a good one it was pretty fun, honestly. Though Leonardo well, it's funny because Lori has my girlfriend has like wanted to rent that multiple times, and I'm like, eh, that doesn't look exciting. That doesn't look good. Why? You know, uh, but... Leonardo DiCaprio is in there, and he plays. He's the lead role, right? Yeah. I mean, he actually like nails that part. He's hilarious in that movie. Yeah. Um. So only watched the first half so far, but it's uh, a long movie. It's three hours. Three long. hours. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah. Who would have thought it was that? The first hour and a half of money, cocaine, strippers, and well, no, that's about it. Uh, <laughs> that sounds like a good combination. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There was a, a scene of somebody eating a goldfish, not Pepperidge Farms, an actual <laughs> goldfish. I uh, took a minute to get that, James. I, I, I was like, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? <laughs> well, um, so what about the difference between, so if you were to brush Upper thigh versus in the hip. What's the advantage of getting the bar all the way into the hip? It, it, it's going to be closer. You know, yeah. uh, it's going to be closer. And, you know, coming, uh, you know, from somebody that's watched a lot of weightlifting, I mean, you're going to be stronger. You know, you're going to be stronger. You're going to, you're going to pop the bar more. You know, and I'm, I'm not, I, I don't think hitting the bar is necessarily advantageous because if you really hit the bar and drive it outwards, of course, you're going to have a curved pull, and that's going to be more difficult to catch. But if you get the bar up into the very top of the hip, um, you're going to be stronger on the pull. Yeah. I mean, so I know that – so Hook Grip put out these these videos of us doing lifts. Um, there's a lot of lifters at the meet. And I know that John kind of has the perception that he smacks the bar with his hips, you know, pretty hard. I do too, but I mean, if you look at these videos, the bar is staying pretty close. So, you know, even 
for me, it feels like that, but it doesn't actually happen that way. Um, does that make sense? It makes sense. I mean, it's very easy to think you're doing something slightly different than what you're actually right. doing. Yeah. But I mean, it certainly feels like you're striking the bar really hard with the hips. And then what actually happens is the bar goes up. Yeah. You know? Well, the bar is on a, uh, you know, has backwards momentum. Mm-hmm. Ideally at that point in the bar path, the bar is moving backwards. And so, as you drive the hips into the bar, um, they're going to counteract that backwards momentum. And hopefully, you know, if everything works out right, they're going to basically counteract the backward momentum and you're going to end up with a net, you know, bar path that your velocity is basically, basically going to be zero except for the upward motion. Yeah. Um, and I mean, something to think about with that too is, a lot of times, what you do and what you think you do are two different things. Well, it's important to know both. And keep an open mind and know that if something happens that you don't think you do and it does happen, just keep an open mind about it. Well, obviously, yeah. if you're teaching someone and the bar is coming a foot away from their body, then you need to not tell them to strike the bar forward. Um, <laughs> but, um, uh, oh, man, what was I going to say? Oh, somebody said something the other day. I thought this was funny, somewhat inappropriate, I guess. But they said, <laughs> somebody was like, act like you're banging a tall chick. Like, move your hips like you're banging a tall chick. Huh. No, I, I can see how that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense to me. I found it hilarious. Yeah, I, I mean, don't know. I figured I'd put it out there on the podcast because it is funny. Hopefully nobody gets offended. Well, it, it makes there. sense to me, and, you know, <laughs> but then, then again, you have to consider, you know, my girlfriend is only like five foot tall, you know, <laughs> so, you know, I mean, that sounds like something I need to keep in mind, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, let's not get gross with it, but, you know, obviously there's a slightly different uh, action if you're, <laughs> you know, there's a slightly different, uh, of what you're actually doing if you're thinking about getting up high. With so your hips. are you on the catapult side of this or the jump and shrug side of this? No, I'm just, I, I, I am, you know, and I, I, I don't come down on the catapult side. I will say that. And, and because I'm not a jump and shrugger, you know, I think that's just stupid. You know, I hope I piss somebody off with that, you know, but as far as a catapult, I'm glad Don's not in here. Of course, he'll he'll listen to this. I hope he does anyway, because I, I don't want to think I'm like talking behind his back. But I think the catapult, the the, the term catapult, has just been so freaking misused. You know, it's become, you know, uh, just a, a, something that people argue about and argue <laughs> about. And I think that it was misunderstood from the start when Don initially used the term. Yeah, and. The misunderstanding has like blossomed and grown to a, to the point where it's a point of contention. You know, I don't even want to say the word catapult because it just has just become a, a point of contention with everybody. Um, I you know you put your hips into the bar, and if everything works the way it should, that should cause the bar to go up. You yeah. know, and let's just leave it at that. You know, you 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 put your hips forward, and the extension used to do that should drive the bar up. Mm-hmm. And you know, I don't know. I, I'm not. I'm not gonna gonna lead the catapult brigade because I just think that it's uh, it's not necessarily a bad thought. You know, I mean, I understand where Don's coming from. Unfortunately, a lot of other people really didn't understand where he was coming from, um, and got carried away with the verbiage, you know, the wording, and looked at it as something different than what he intended, and that has become a distraction. Yeah. Well, very much so. So, so just drive the bar up. Drive people. the bar up. You know, the bar has to go up. Like you're banging a tall chick. <laughs> like you're banging a tall chick. Well, the bar has to come in and then up. If it goes out, you're going to push it out even further, right? Yeah. So, anyways, in off the floor, up at the hip. Um, now, anything else before we get out of here and go to training? We got Wednesday afternoon training. Pretty hard day. Um. Uh, you know, and I, and I have to squat. You know, I'm I'm tempted. <laughs> I'm tempted to try 60 kilos today. What do you think? Well, you know, at least 57. So. 
Yeah, at least uh, 57. I'm tempted. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. We'll have to, well, I'll have to get out there and warm up with my regular 40 kilo warm up and see how I feel. Yeah. Well, I saw you doing it. There's no doubt you can, uh, you can do it. it. I think your balance is getting better each week, too. Yeah. I mean, the balance well, is getting better. Yeah, so. I hope, I hope so. The, the balance is something that's going to carry over no matter what the weight is. Yeah. So. You know what? I'm just going to go ahead and say this in front of everybody. I, uh, we did this complex of three position snatch this morning. And I did 120, one from the floor, one from below the knee, and one from the hip. And uh, and then Matt did 21, 21. And Matt did 21. I even made a wager with him because I didn't think he was going to get it. But he went and made it. Now I've got to wear a Ball State cheerleading shirt because <laughs> I lost my wager against Matt. Well, he definitely wanted it. Uh Yeah. I mean, James went off the percentages, to be fair. And then no, he, he I didn't. His, well, okay. He was, <laughs> I, I mean, I, he I was little... in his tennis shoes. It's not like James maxed out on yeah. the exercise. Um, but that was definitely a PR for Matt. He did great. Um, he's really been, uh, sorry, Matt, he's really, uh, been putting himself out there, calling people out like, Hey, what'd you do today? I'm going to beat it. And you know, to be honest with you, he surprised me because like 90% of the time that he's done this, I'm like, there's no freaking way that he's going to make this weight. And he's made it. Well, so. I'm still surprised when he makes 121 on a consistent single basis, like yeah. just for singles. And then he did it for a three position snatch. Well, I have yeah. to Dang. say, I have to say that that, uh, like particularly you and him, because you and him tend to, you know, get in those little wagers more often than anyone else. But that's added so much to match training. You know, it's, uh, yeah, absolutely. being able to compete against you, um, has just been wonderful for him. It's been wonderful for his progress. Um, so it, I think it's good to do, and it's good that you do that, and uh, he has been getting a lot out of it. Yeah, it makes training fun. Yeah, so look out for that video where James has to wear a Ball State cheerleading shirt. Hopefully he picks out the most ridiculous one. Um, I don't know. Maybe he's got it out there right now. <laughs> I don't know. But, yeah, putting it out there again. Um, and he actually made all three. We were pretty strict on the judging this time. Because there was one instance where the first one was a little iffy, and we said, "Hey, look, you have to, you have to control it before you bring it back down." Mm-hmm. So he legitimately made 121 for a triple, and uh, show James up for the morning session, anyways. Um, yeah. Do you have any predictions for the afternoon session? Are you going to come back and put him down this afternoon just because he beat you this morning, or? Well, I guess that depends on what we're doing. I, uh, I, I took a long time off of squats, of squatting heavy, uh, just cause I had some calf issues, but, uh, and then I finally squatted a little bit heavier for the first time this morning. So we'll see how my legs do. So maybe that'll make it even with me and Matt. I might try to do, um, I've been going from the high blocks, but I might try to do from the hip in the hang today, you know, sets of three or five or something like that. Um, anyways, guys, you got anything else? I do not. Cool. Well, let's get to training. Um, the Teespring campaign, uh, that ended about a week ago. Thank all you, thanks for all you guys who ordered. We had 55 orders, so that's awesome, more than I expected. Um, those should be shipping out in the next week or so, so hopefully you guys get those. And, uh, we will see you guys either Friday or next week, most likely next week.